Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask that you be here with us, that the words of my mouth may be the truth about you, and that you may be glorified, Lord. Help us to see your word with your eyes, and help us to understand what you would like us to learn. So, um, as a Seventh Day Adventist uh, Christian since about 2003, I shortly after becoming a Christian, I came to the belief that God is a pure God and there's no violence at all in Him, and that Satan is a destroyer. And um, I, I just came to that conclusion through my studies and through a lot of searching and a lot of prayer and just a lot of looking at Jesus Christ and his revelation of who God is. And I have come across many times, especially with seven Adventists who know their Bible very well, a verse um, about God and his strange work. And I looked at it a few times trying to understand what that strange work, but I never looked at it in real depth. And so today, um, I want to share a study that I just did on this in, in much more depth than before. And hopefully it will make sense to all of us. So that passage is taken from Isaiah 28, verse 21. The Lord will rise up as in Mount Perazim. He will be angry as in the valley of Gibeon. That he may do his work, his awesome work, the King James says, strange work, and bring to pass his act, his unusual, again, and the strange, strange in the King James Version. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is systematically take each one of those words that I highlighted and do a little bit of research into them and into the events, into what the words mean, so that we can have an idea of when does the Lord rise up and does his strange work, how does he do it, and why does he do it? So let's look at the first one, the Lord will rise up. And I, you know, I've come to learn that the Bible speaks through metaphors everywhere, symbols, metaphors, and, and if we, we have to allow the Bible itself to, to uh, give us an understanding of what those metaphors and symbols mean. So if you look at the word, this, the phrase, the Lord will rise up, the first thing that came to my mind was Stephen. Because when Stephen was being stoned to death, he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus, standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. <clears throat> And Ellen White says in Acts of the Apostles that to him the gates of heaven were ajar, and looking in he saw the glory of the courts of God and Christ as if just risen from his throne, standing ready to sustain his servant. In words of triumph, Stephen exclaimed, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So when Jesus stood, when Stephen saw him, he was ready to sustain his servant who was being persecuted. Now Ellen White says, <coughs> regarding the, the 70 weeks or 409 years, especially allotted to the Jews, that it ended in AD 34. At that time, through the action of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the nation sealed its rejection of the gospel by the martyrdom of Stephen and the persecution of the followers of Christ. So that standing up of Jesus has a dual meaning. He stands up to sustain the servant, but also it meant that in that act of persecuting Stephen, the, the Jewish nation had sealed their rejection of the gospel. And so when, <coughs> when it persecutes and kills it's Stephen, they seal the rejection of the gospel. Jesus stands up to sustain him in Israel then, uh, suffers the wrath of God 70 years later. <clears throat> the wrath of God is not declared against unrepentant sinners merely because of the sins they have committed, but because when called to repent, they choose to continue in resistance 
repeating the sins of the past and defiance of the life given them. So there's another instance where Jesus stands up, and that's in uh, Daniel 12, verse 1. But before that, in chapter 11, we see the king who exalts himself persecuting the people of God. And they fall by the sword and the flame, by captivity, by spoil, by spoil by many days, for many days. And then just before chapter 12, again, we see that the king, of, uh, the king who exalts himself shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many, and that's persecution. And that's when Michael stands up, the great prince which stands for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. So when Michael stands up, the Genesis Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, and I'll be looking at a, quite a few words here. It, it, the word means to stand, to sustain, and to stand before a king to serve. So Jesus, the servant, he stands up to serve. So when we um, read that verse, that the Lord shall rise up, shall stand at Mount Perizim, now there's a new understanding for me of what it means for him to stand. He stands to sustain his people who are being persecuted um, and to defend them. Um, so when the king who exalts himself persecutes God people, God's people, he seals his rejection of the gospel. And Jesus stands up to sustain his people. And then there's a time of trouble such as never was, just like the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Um, when Ellen White talked about the sealing, uh, she saw, I'm just going to go a little faster through this, some of these, um, I'll just go here, that um, Jesus will pour out his wrath on those who have rejected the truth. And she saw that the anger of the nations, the wrath of God, and the time to judge the dead were separate and distinct events following each other. <clears throat> and also that Michael had not yet stood up, and that the time of trouble, such as never was, had not yet commenced. The nations are now getting angry, but when our high priest has finished his work in the sanctuary, he will stand up, put on the garments of vengeance, and then the seven last plagues will be poured out. I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work had been done. And then, when they let go, the seven last plagues will come. And, um, and then there's the persecution. A, a decree went forth to slay the saints. And at that time, God is going to come to the rescue of his people. So he's, you know, I'm starting to see a pattern, the same mechanism that happens each time. So for the Lord will rise up, I hope that creates a new meaning for us. As in Mount Perizim, now we need to find out what happened at Mount Perizim. Mm -hmm. And we can find that out in 2 Samuel 5, 17-21. Now when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went out to search for David. And David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. So basically they're going to battle. The Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the, in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. So David went to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me, like a breakthrough of water. Therefore he called the name of that place Baal Perazim. And they left their images there, and David and his men carried them away. So the word Baal Perazim actually means the Lord of the breaches. The breaks. And if you look at the Genesis, um, again, Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, 
It means a rupture, a breach in a wall, which is uh, a metaphor. Taken from besiegers who rush into a city through the breaches in the wall in great numbers and with great violence. From the same idea is that phrase, to stand in the breach, you've heard that, to stand in the gap, to repel the enemy. And that's what Moses did in Psalm 106, 23. It says that, therefore, he's, you know, Moses had come down from the mountain, the people were worshiping the golden calf, and the Lord said, I'm going to smite them and kill every one of them. And Moses, who had more love than God, said, no, don't do that, right? No. <laughs> um, but yes, Moses interfered, he prayed, and he stood in the breach, and the breach, and God was able to save the people from destruction. He interceded for the people. So the breach's metaphor usually refers to a break in the wall surrounding a city, and a city is a, another uh, symbol or metaphor for God's kingdom. And there it is. So once you have that breach, the enemy comes in like a flood and takes over the city. So at Mount Perizim, that's what happened. There was a breach and the enemy came in. There was a breach in the Philistines. I mean, they had, well, we'll see, we'll see the, the, the whole thing in a, in a little bit. So the wall is another metaphor in the Bible for something that protects us. We're inside the city and the wall protects us from the enemy. And the metaphor is that it's explained in Isaiah 26. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. And also in Isaiah 60, 18. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation. And so, what is salvation? <coughs> the gospel is our salvation. Right? The good news that Jesus came to tell us. The law that he came to exalt. And so the wall is usually uh, referred to God's law because, as we'll see, when we step outside of God's law, then we, we make a breach in the wall and the enemy can come in and get us. It's as if we move ourselves away from God's jurisdiction and then the enemy has power over us. And so... There it is, the breach in the wall, and the wall protects us. We, it, it's a matter of jurisdiction. What causes a breach in the wall? And there are many places in the Bible that tell us what does this breach in the wall. And I'm just going to go quickly through a few of them. Um, the first one in Ezekiel 22 says, The priests have violated God's law. And there it is, the law, the first thing, and profaned his holy things. They also have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy. They have, they have made known, sorry, they have not made known the difference between the clean and the unclean. They have hidden their eyes from his Sabbath so that he is profaned among them. The princes in her midst are like wolves, which is a, again a symbol of violence. They tear up the prey to shed blood, they destroy the people, they get dishonest gain. Her prophets plaster them with untempered mortar, seeing false visions, and divining lies for them, saying, thus says the Lord, when the Lord has not spoken. So <clears throat> they tear the prey to shed, to shed blood, destroy the people, get dishonest gain, um, and so forth. Also, the people of the land have used oppressions, they have committed robbery. You can see all transgression of the law of love, and on and on. Mistreat of the poor, wrongfully oppressed the, the stranger. Um, so how is the breach made? When we use our power to shed blood, when we make light of father and mother, any of the commandments, when we break the love, when we live outside of love, oppress the stranger, uh, and so forth. And it goes on and on. So I'm just going to go very quickly. And it's all there. All the, the things that refer to the um, Ten Commandments as well. So 
Therefore, this is what the Lord says, because you despise his word, this word, and trust in oppression and perversity, and rely on them. Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you like a breach red, ready to fall, a bulge in a high wall, whose breaking comes suddenly in an instant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the Philistines, they <coughs> went to war against David, who was God's servant, a chosen servant. They sealed their rejection of the gospel by persecuting him. The Lord rose up to protect Israel, and then the Lord delivered the Philistines. He gave them up like a breakthrough of water, like a sudden breakthrough of water. And their iniquity was to them like a breach ready to fall, a bulge in a high wall, whose breaking comes suddenly in an instant. So the next word that we're going to look at um, is the word angry, which is the word wrath, wrath. The King James says that the Lord will rise up as he did in Mount Perizim, he will be wrath, okay? So what is the wrath of God? And there's, a, there's so much in the Bible that explains the wrath of God, but I'm going to be very short and brief. But the word angry used in this verse, I don't know how to say it in Hebrew, but it means to be moved, to be disturbed. It can, be, it can mean anger, but it can also mean grief. So, and fear, to tremble, to quake. Now, in Romans 1.18, Paul explains what the wrath of God, because Paul really understood the metaphors of the Old Testament. Basically, what Paul says is that God gives up those who reject him. Therefore, he says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, and then he goes on through many things, and then he says, therefore the Lord <coughs> gave them up to these things that they have chosen. But the greatest place to understand the wrath of, cro uh, of, the wrath of God, I believe, is the cross, because this is what Ellen White says, Christ was to take the wrath of God, which, is just, which injustice should fall upon man. So if we look at Christ and see what happened to him at the cross, we'll understand what the wrath of God is, because Christ was to take the wrath of God. In Selected Messages, it says, Christ's heart was pierced by a far sharper pain than that caused by the nails driven into his hands and feet. He was bearing the sins of the whole world, and during our punishment, the wrath of God against transgression. So clearly here, the wrath of God and the cross are connected to this uh, statement by Ellen White. And then it's, she says, his trial at that place, at the cross, involved the fierce temptation of thinking that he was forsaken of God. So here we get a very good look at what the wrath of God is, and we'll see as we go on that this is substantiated by the, by the further study of this. So the Lord will rise up, as he did in Mount Perizim, and he will be wrath. He will forsake, as he did in the Valley of Gideon. So let's look at the Valley of Gideon. It's found in Joshua 10, verses 1 to 14. Now it came to pass, when Adonizek, king of Jerusalem, had heard that Joshua had taken the city of Ai, and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and her king, so he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, as one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all the men thereof were mighty. Wherefore, Adonizek, king of Jerusalem, that they had not yet taken Jerusalem, the children of Israel, sent unto Hoham king of Hebron, and unto Piram king of Jarmuth, and unto Japhia king of Lachish, and unto Debir king of Eglon, saying, Come up unto me, and help me, that we may smite Gideon. For he had made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, these were Amorites, and Amorites were people that lived in the mountains. 
Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua, sent unto Joshua to the camp of Gilgal, saying, Slack not your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into your hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. And just a quick look at that word delivered, to give, also to give, to give anyone into custody, and to allow or to permit. So the Lord is going to give the Amorites, he's going to give them into custody to another master, he's also going to allow or permit something to happen. Um, to be given, to be delivered. So the Lord is going to deliver them just as we saw in Romans. So Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal at night. And, when the, and the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goes up to beth Horon, and smote them to Azekah and unto Makedon. So what the Lord did was he discomfited them. And we have to see what that means. Um, to impel, to drive, to disturb, to put in commotion, to put into flight, to destroy utterly, to make extinct. So, and it came to pass, as they fled from before Israel, and were in the going down to Beth Aron, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. There were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Okay? Now, this is what Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets. By marching all night, Joshua brought his forces before Gideon in the morning. Scarcely had the Confederate princes mustered their armies about the city when Joshua was upon them. The attack resulted in utter discomfiture of the assailants. The immense host fled before Joshua up the mountain paths. They were in complete confusion and complete. They were in, in fear. And having gained the height, when they got up there, they rushed down the, pre the precipitous descent un upon the other side. Here a fierce hailstorm burst upon them. The Lord cast down great stones from heaven. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Now, in Councils on Health, curiously enough, Ellen White says this, Satan works through the elements also to garner his harvest of unprepared souls. He has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature, and he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. When he was suffered to afflict Job, how quickly flocks and herds, servants, houses, children were swept away, one trouble succeeding another in a moment. It is God that shields his creatures, and these are not just the children of Israel, but his creatures, all of us, all human beings, and hedges them in from the power of the destroyer. But the Christian world have shown contempt for the law of Jehovah, and the Lord will do just what he has declared that he will do. He will withdraw his blessings from the earth and remove his protecting care from those who are rebelling against his law, and teaching his law and teaching and forcing others to do the same. Satan has control of all whom God does not specially guard. He will favor and prosper some in order to further his own desires, designs, and he will bring trouble upon others, 
and lead men to believe that it is God who is afflicting them. Now, I have also recently done a study on the gods. Baal, which is basically Zeus, they're all, they're all the same. They're all Satan, but Satan has used different gods in different ages with different names and different cultures. But they basically have the same character. Now, these gods were considered to be the gods of the sky. The Lord of the sky and rain. Their weapons were thunderbolts, which they hurled at those who displeased or defied them, especially liars and oath breakers. Rulers of the skies and the earth, God of all natural phenomena of the sky, ruler of the state, father of the gods and men. They could create all natural phenomena related to their air and the sky, such as storms, tempests, and intense darkness. This is taken from, and I forgot to put the reference here, I'm sorry, but it's taken from an encyclopedia of mythical mythology. Um, as the father of men, this was speaking specifically about Zeus, but Baal is the same. As the father of men, he took a paternal interest in the action, paternal interest in the actions and the well-being of mortals. He watched over them with tender solicitude, rewarding, favoring and prospering some, rewarding truth, charity and fairness, while severely punishing, bringing trouble upon others, as Ellen White said, perjury and cruelty. Even the poorest and the most forlorn wanderer could find a powerful advocate in this God. For he, as a wise and merciful paternal figure, demanded that the wealthy inhabitants of the world be attentive to the needs of the less fortunate fellow citizens. And we are seeing this manifestation of Zeus Baal in our world today through what's happening and I hate to name names, but it is happening through our Pope, who is trying to, you know, redistribute wealth. Well, it, it all, it's, it's a wonderful concept, but it, it's not coming from God. 400 years earlier, in Genesis, 400 years before the, uh, the Amorites attacked David, God had given Abraham a dream he had said, um, now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. He wasn't even Abraham yet, he was Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Basically, he was watching his children of Israel go through Egypt for 400 years. Then he said to Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land, Egypt, that is not theirs and will serve them, be slaves in Egypt, and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, here meaning where Abram was, which was in the land of Canaan, where the promised land, for the iniquity of the, the Amorites is not yet complete. So what does that mean? Israel was in Egypt 400 years, but the people of God could not yet go back there to the Promised Land because the Amorites were living there and their iniquity was not fulfilled, was not yet complete. God couldn't just get rid of them. God was waiting hope, little by little, trying to bring them to the Gospel but they were rejecting it step by step. So we have another metaphor, the cup of iniquity being full. And Ellen White says, On the Amorites the Lord said, In the fourth generation they shall come hither, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Although this nation was conspicuous because of its idolatry and corruption, it had not yet fulfilled the cup of iniquity, of its iniquity, and God would not command for its utter destruction. God would not give them up to Satan for its utter destruction. The people were to see the divine power manifested in a marked manner that they might be left without excuse. The compassionate creator was willing to bear with their iniquity until the fourth generation. Then, if no change was seen for the better, his judgments were to fall upon them. 
These nations on the border of Canaan would have been spared had they not stood in defiance of God's word to oppose Israel. The Lord gave Abraham the promise, in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. They rejected the light. God spared them for 400 years to give unmistakable evidence that he was the only true God. All his wonders in bringing Israel from Egypt were known to them. They might have known the truth, but they rejected the light and clung to their idols. Now the other ones, um, the ones that David came to rescue, Gibeon, they accepted the gospel and they joined the children of Israel. And the Lord did not bring the wrath of his wrath upon them. So when their cup was full, God gave them up. Because God does not infringe on our, our freedom. Freedom is one of the most important things to God. Because if we remove our freedom, we become automatons. And you cannot have a relationship with a robot. And God, the freedom that we have is sacred to God. When the Lord brought his people a second time to the borders of Canaan, additional evidence of his power, did I already read this? No. It, additional evidence of his power was granted those heathen nations. They saw that God was with Israel in the victory over King Arad and the Canaanites, and in the miracle to save those perishing from the sting of the serpent. The Israelites, in all their journeyings and encampments, had done no injury to the people of their possessions. On reaching the border of the Amorites, Israel had asked permission only to travel directly through the country, promising to observe the same rules that had governed their intercourse with other nations. When the Amorite king refused and defiantly gathered his host for battle, their cup of iniquity was full, and God would now exercise his power to overthrow them. So, we see that the Amorites went to war against Israel. They filled their cup of iniquity or sealed their rejection of the gospel by doing that, by going to war with Israel. And then the Lord rises up to protect Israel, and they are greatly discomfited, and hail falls from heaven, from the God of this world. Going back to, so we've seen how the Lord will rise up, we've seen what happened at Perizim, We've seen what the anger of the Lord is. We've seen what happened at the Valley of Gibeon. And now we'll see what the Lord's strange work is. The word means to turn aside, to depart. The actual word for strange in that place right there, according to the King James and the Strong's and Genesius, is to turn aside, to depart. So the Lord is going to turn aside. They've chosen to go this way, and the Lord is going to let them, and the Lord is going to turn aside. So to turn aside from someone, to turn aside from the way, to be a stranger. The Lord was going to become a stranger to them, because they had chosen another God. And isn't that what happened to Jesus? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned aside from me? Can you see the connection, the wrath of God? God's turning aside causes total discom dis discom sorry, discomfiture. And isn't that what happened to Jesus at the cross? His heart literally burst. And he did it to show it to us so that we would get it, that it wasn't God doing that to him, but that he was given up to this, to this wrathful, Master, this veil, the word veil means master. And he was given up for our sakes so that we would come to know the God of love. And so the last word is another word, it's unusual, strange, but it's not the same word as the previous one. According to the Genesis Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, it's a strange as in foreign, unheard of. So God is going to do his strange work, his unusual, unheard of, foreign. It's a foreign work to him to let go, to stop protecting. It's not like God to do that. God is always like a mother hen, 
how much did I want to save you by being a hand and you would not have anything to do with it. It's out of God's, it's out of character for God to let go and he does it with the uttermost pain, utmost pain and grief because he knows the horror that Satan will put his beloved children through. And so we have the great antitype just in front of us and this study just blew me away. It opened my mind to the fact that we're about to see this happen in front of us. About to happen. I mean, the vote is coming on the 23rd. He's going to speak to Congress and then he's going to speak to the Council of Families in Philadelphia, which their agenda completely is, is about installing Sunday and removing the Sabbath. And when persecution comes, we'll know that the end will be right there. And the seventh angel poured out his vial in the air, in the air. That's very significant because Satan is the king of the air, the lord of the air, the prince of the air. Okay? And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. The great controversy is over. My goodness, we're about there, people. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. Oh, sorry. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. We've never seen anything like this. All these types that we've been looking at today, the Amorites, the, the Philistines, they're nothing compared to what's going to happen in our future. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Unmixed, there is no more mercy because they have rejected mercy. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Does that remind you of something? Right? Gibeon, they went up the hill, up the mountains, and as they were coming down the other side, great hail fell upon them. Every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of hail. What does that mean? They blasphemed God because they think He is doing it. They are blaspheming His name because they're saying, why are you doing this to us? But it has, He has nothing to do with it. And so we see that in our near future, the king who exalts himself are, is going to persecute God's people on the Sunday Sabbath issue. He's going, to be, he's going to be seeing his rejection of the gospel in that act. And Jesus will stand up, Michael will stand up, and then a time of trouble such as never was is going to break, as Ellen White says, as an overwhelming surprise upon the earth. So when does the Lord rise up? When a nation seals its rejection of the gospel by going to war against people, he rises up to sustain, protect, save his people. But at the same time, he lets go. The rejection of the gospel manifests itself as a persecution of God's people through everything we've seen today. And so Jesus rises up to sustain the Lord turns, turns aside, departs from the rejectors, rejectors of his grace, when the cup of their iniquity is full. He has given every chance for them to accept the God of love, the God of, the God of Jesus Christ, who gave his life so that we may come to this understanding that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Then there is utter confusion and discomfiture and the destroyer is given complete freedom to work out his own will. And so, at this time, I'd like to play a little um, mini cartoon that uh, I've been putting together for the last few weeks. As a medium, I'm trying to find a medium that maybe I can reach people with the message. And so, if we could just have the lights off, and then if Don can play that.
Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it. And cleared out its stones. And planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst. And also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes. But it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, Judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug. But there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. But why would the Lord do all these things to his people? Because he looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. What else does the Lord warn us about? Woe to those who join house to house. They add field to field, till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. <sighs> Woe to those who rise early in the morning, that they may follow intoxicating drink who continue until night, till wine inflames them, the harp and the strings, the tambourining flute, and wine are in their feasts. But they do not regard the work of the Lord, nor consider the operation of his hands. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin as if with a cart rope. Woe to those who call evil good, and good evil. Who put darkness for light, and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. Woe to men mighty at drinking wine, woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink, who justify the wicked for a bribe, and take away justice from the righteous man. Because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble, and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. More and more the world is setting at naught the claims of God. Men have become bold in transgression. The wickedness of the inhabitants of the world has almost filled up the measure of their iniquity. This earth has almost reached the place where God will permit the destroyer to work his will upon it. 
the substitution of the laws of men for the law of God, the exaltation, by merely human authority, of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath, is the last act in the drama. When this substitution becomes universal, God will reveal himself. The restraining spirit of God is even now being withdrawn from the world. Hurricanes, storms, tempests, fire and flood, disasters by sea and land, follow each other in quick succession. Science seeks to explain all these. The signs thickening around us, telling of the near approach of the Son of God, are attributed to any other than the true cause. Men cannot discern the sentinel angels restraining the four wings that they shall not blow until the servants of God are sealed. But when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there shall be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. Two thousand years ago, while beholding the impending destruction of Jerusalem, the Lord's eyes filled with tears. His body rocked to and fro like a tree before the tempest, and a wail of anguish burst from his quivering lips, as if from the depths of a broken heart. The Lord is slow to let go of those he loves with an infinite love, but he will honor each one's precious freedom, and will at last do his act, his strange act of letting go of his protection of those who reject his grace. Now is the day of salvation, now is the accepted time. Come, now, and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with a sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it.
And so my prayer, Lord, is that we will all humble our hearts and come to you and, and give ourselves completely to you. In Jesus' name.